Welcome back to Guess in the Mecca, and in today's episode, we are discussing Heiki Monogatari once again. And honestly, I couldn't help myself when it come when it came to discussing this amazing show. Um, Heiki Monogatari has really surpassed my expectations, as you know. And you guys also really liked my previous episode on the first four episodes. And so in this episode, um, we're going to be tackling episode nine, which might be considered one of the best episodes in the series so far. In this week's episode, I want to do kind of a bit of a whistle stop tour through how this storyboarder slash episode director tackles this amazing episode from a visual point of view. And what again, as always from this podcast, what can we learn when it comes to like filmmaking, storytelling, and so on. I should have said this in the intro, but just a quick disclaimer, there will be spoilers, of course, for Heiki Monogatari episode 9 and the show so far, so if you haven't seen it, it's probably a good idea that you do so before you watch this episode or listen to it. Uh, And on that note, I I do highly recommend watching this episode of the podcast if you're not. Um, Of course, listening to it would be fine, but there is quite a lot of visual analysis and I'm trying some new things. So if you want to pop over to YouTube, then that would be a great help and you'd probably get more out of this podcast episode. The first port of call for this episode, obviously, is to recognize who storyboarded and directed this episode. And that individual goes by the name of Ryohei Takashita. Uh, Takashita was mainly introduced to me through Jujutsu Kaisen's first cut, as they directed both episodes 2 and 9. Uh, probably some of the standout, I would say the standout episodes of that cut, with those really big moments, such as the fight between Sukuna and Gojo, as well as um, sort of the, I, I want to say, emergence of Nanami's character kind of getting into the show as well. So they have two really great Jujutsu Kaisen episodes but that being said I don't really think they introduced me very well to what this director has to offer and I think nothing could prepare me for Heiki Monogatari episode 9 in all honesty. However if you do want to get a better taste of their style I would point you of course to something like the second ending for Jujutsu Kaisen which they did do as well as the Senpai's Annoying opening which they also did from this year so they've done a lot but but it's all very high quality work. Both really are defined by the camera work and the way in which they really embrace the imperfections of the lens and all these different means of shooting. Like they have these uncropped phone displays <laughs> and they're in vertical and everything. Uh, and of course you have like the lens distortion which comes from the, the lens of said camera or phone or whatever and it feels very natural and organic and that's something that they really embrace and that's something we'll see in this episode that's really what ties it together. I find Takshita's place in this directorial team really interesting mainly because it feels like quite a coincidence that we have two directors, the series director Yamada, as well as Takashita working on the same thing since they value such similar things when it comes to filmmaking especially when it comes of course camera the camera lens and that organic feeling that they create from it and so them working together feels like a really great pairing and something that even though I didn't really know I, I really wanted it, it it turned out to be exactly what I wanted and I think this combination of creatives is something that is honestly almost unmatched, as we see in this episode. I've decided to split up this episode into three parts, namely being lighting, focus and the lens, as well as composition and cut. But let's begin with the first one being lighting. Lighting is probably the biggest pillar in the directorial style of Takashita, and immediately from the beginning of the episode we're given these various tastes or varying tastes in lighting from the glow of the moonlight to the sun lighting up the coastline and what's interesting is how they're all unified by the fact that they're all very natural sources of light we have this fading sequence which has these different almost moods of lighting and that's all connected by the fact that they're natural and they continue to push this further and further throughout the episode and kind of meeting that sort of visual 
<laughs> visual promise that they establish. Perhaps it's a bit of a reach, but I think the sort of naturalness of the lighting in this episode really speaks to that very key topic in this episode and this show being death and the fact that we're all naturally going to come to an end no matter what. The same sun and moon shines on all of us and regardless of whether we're in the nobility or we're simply just a peasant or commoner as they may say, we are all unified by that same idea by virtue of being human. But back to the technical stuff, I think what's really mind-boggling about lighting in animation generally is the fact that the light source doesn't actually exist in terms of there isn't actually a sun shining into the room. You create the sun. The sun essentially is a construct in which said animator and creatives working on this episode have to forge for themselves. And particularly for an episode like this, I just think about the amount of knowledge that one has to accumulate to light scenes so perfectly. And it says a lot that it shows Takashita's know-how in the sense that they're able to use one source of light, of light being, you know, the sun and the reflection of it to really light this entire thing and just use one source in so many different ways. There are all these varying contrasting colors and patterns of lighting in this episode from the orange glow of the sunset to portray like that rekindled bond between Biwa and her mother, the sharp golden beaming sun <laughs> that hits the coastline in Jirin and sets the stage for Atomari's like noble final stand. It, it, it has that golden look to it. And then and that really works well for when the camera gets super intimate and the light kind of lines his face. Um, this will kind of become more important later into the episode, uh, at least the later into this podcast episode. But I think lighting is something to get down because that's like the foundation for how a lot of these shots work. Each color of lighting, each pattern, it kind of has its own story in itself. We can even talk about like the negative blue color, the very like cold and unforgiving color of the moonlight, that has its own story too when it comes to again death and what some of the characters are facing in this episode. So all of this is connected by one thing and it will kind of become more apparent how important it is when we line it up with the other techniques and things that they do in this episode. Takashita's knowledge when it comes to lighting really pays off when you see how that applies to the lens and uh, or at least the imaginary one which we use for capturing animation. So many of these scenes take into account just the right amount of lens flare to compensate for of course the natural light source being the sun for most of this episode. And one of my favorite shots in this episode really has to be this very subtle leg movement during, or at least it's a very quick shot within the episode during Atsumori's final fight. And essentially what he's doing is that he's fighting this person and he steps backwards uh, to kind of parry the, the enemy's sword. And the sun kind of goes from being blocked to then being exposed. And the camera has the light flare that just about hits at the right time. And it also reflects on the sword as well. So we get this amazing glint and kind of this nod as to what he's going to do next. Because, you know, our eyes are drawn to the sun and the sword as a result of it becoming exposed. The same goes for Biwa's big moment when she says that her, her name is Biwa, when it looks like the sun is kind of moving, uh, I think it, it theoretically it looks like the sun was moving behind like a cloud or something because it gets slightly darker. And as a result, you get this really nice glare which comes on her clothing uh, as she looks forward. These are all very small things, I know, and I might be sounding like I'm picking out the tiniest things to talk about, but it's just the idea that all these intricate and small details like this are thought out. These aren't just things that happen naturally because, you know, the sun is out at this time. Or, oh, it's golden hour. No, we create, or at least Takashita created golden hour for this shot to work. <laughs> and it's, a, yeah, so these are all very small things, but I think they make the most powerful moments in this episode even more powerful. And that that's kind of what lighting in animation generally is just 
an art in itself because it, it's a completely different layer to the rest of the show. It, you have to figure that out in, in order to compose and create these amazing shots. You have to figure out what is your lighting and, and create that for yourself. And Takashida does that. Not to say that there's more and lesser art, but I think it's perhaps more of an art when you consider that these, these this form of lighting is all built around like the laws of realism essentially. And that's what's just so impressive. He constructs his own lighting system for this episode to work on from a visual point of view. And he sticks to it relentlessly throughout the entire thing, throughout the entire course of the episode. And it shows so much care and intentionality. Uh, as I usually say, I, I really love when anime feels like it's made by people. And this episode feels like a labor of love from the creator and creatives behind it. This leads us very nicely into the focus in which is applied in this episode. And this episode overall just showcases a really big shift in the meaning and context in the shallow depth of field and focus and how that's applied. If we go back to Yamada's first episode, episode one, which is storyboard and directed by her, the shallowness definitely serves a different purpose. It's more so to highlight these quite distinguished people in the courts just like the Heiki are in society and as a whole. But when we go back to episode 9, it feels like the Heiki have kind of been the ones who are drowned out. Them and their associates are simply just a part of the visual noise and background and the backdrop for kind of what's going on as they were marching through these sort of wetlands or through the mud in order to escape and flee all the violence in which has been taking place. It's just so funny because what the Heiki considered to kind of just be the background noise of society were the commoners and now they've become what they, or at least Kiyomori and Ko were the ones saying, I'm not saying everyone in the Heiki thought that or associated with them thought that, but that was the general philosophy. But now they are exactly what they simply did not like or what they were opposed to. We can of course talk about this next to the very drab colours which you get in this episode as well as like the plant and flower language paired with it too. We discussed it last time but the flowers are kind of the underlying visual metaphor and extended one which permeates a lot of this show and it being representative of of course, vitality in life, but they've kind of gained and obtained a different meaning as things have gone along, uh, being death and the fact that if we go back to the first episode, which the sort of Biwa song or Biwa instrument being, <laughs> still don't know exactly who she is yet, but we kind of have a bit of an idea. It's really how she's talking about how everything that exists can fall, everything that lives eventually dies. And that's kind of the meaning in which the flowers have taken on throughout the series. And now we associate them with death and destruction and, and all these other negative connotations. And now we see the Heiki marching through weeds and mud, which we associate, I assume we would associate much more with much more negative emotions, or at least much more perhaps just sad ones. And then when we come to the focus in itself, you see that the camera focuses more on the plants than it does the Heiki. <laughs> and I feel like that's just a very slight visual nod from Takashita telling us what is, I don't say the plants are more important than the people but it's the fact that they've again been drowned out and it's the environment around them is kind of becoming stronger as the pressure on them builds and of course their surroundings have become much more hostile as a result of their actions and political decisions. Takshita cares so much about this natural organic feel to, to filmmaking when it comes to animation and sends us these really subtle messages through the camera alone and even if it's through simple techniques it's very effective as a result. Finally, let's talk about composition and cuts. And these are two things that really show off how much control I would say Takshita has of this episode. And I mean that more in the sense that they're able to really guide the emotional impacts and like beats of this episode from the visual level alone. 
and that's so care it's so carefully like steered and guided through of course how the shots are composed and how they're put next to each other and strung together and that's really where this episode shines because it's so emotional and we have to look to Takashi in order to really understand that the compositions in this episode kind of follow suit with some of the things we've seen in this show already but it's given a bit of a unique chaotic flavor to show this real breakdown in order and events. If we go back to the first episode quickly, the Yamada style of composing a shot, particularly in this show, typically concerns utilizing the either far left or far right of the screen, and throughout that episode our eyes are very easily guided throughout uh, these directions and they go to of course connote the divisions in which we've spoken about in this episode and I did last time. I'm not going to explain them again but all those divisions th that exist in the show and uh, considering that this was a very decent time for the Heiki, this makes a lot of sense. The camera is almost at 180 degrees, everything's sort of flat, <laughs> not flat, but everything's sort of straight facing. You don't have these crazy upwards and downwards angles or diagonals, it's very orderly and um, it, it, the camera feels almost like it's at peace. It's it's resting nicely on a table or something like that. But when we get to Takshita's episode, it's a completely different story. Takshita's episode really showcases this breakdown in, in the order and which is established in the other episodes when, of course, we look to Yamada's episode where we have, as I said before, the very straight camera, the symmetrical compositions of Ayuki Mura and sort of the verticality as well. Everything felt very aligned. Whereas Takashita's feels much more disorderly to connote the disruption in the clan's uh, way of living and everything really is coming to an end. I don't really want to call this anime a slow burner because it does move pretty fast <laughs> and, and I'm sure you guys probably know that if you're watching it but the burn of this anime, I, I refuse to call it slow though, uh, the burn of this anime is really starting to show itself in the visual language and Takashita really helps push it forward. Uh, it's something that was already connoted in these previous episodes. It's definitely something that's been building up uh, and th this isn't something we, we're not aware of, but it's showing itself visually as well as we're kind of looking death right in the face as these main characters are dying left, right and center. We also have these very divided compositions too, as seen in the final showdown of this episode. And I have not too much to say on this because it's everything I've kind of said before about the divisions between Heiki and the rest of society or the divisions between the Genji and the Heiki as they're obviously fighting um, but it's just really cool how everything is done through natural means or so much of it's done through natural means like you could do this as a split screen and there's nothing wrong with this but being able to use the world as your form of division by having like say the ocean or the sea and the sand kind of as these binary opposites or putting the camera at a point in which it's able to capture the water level or at least where the water obviously that kind of positions itself in arena to explain that and then having the air above it it's all very divided and split up very nicely to imply all these things about what the Heiki are going through. I've decided to save my favorite shot and shot choices till the very end and it's really got to be the stunning, the stunning shot of Atsumori in the water and this beautiful close-up in which has him so swearing as a, to, to be this noble warrior. Um, genuinely the best shot in the series, I think. But what exactly makes this shot really effective? And I wouldn't say it's just the shot itself, but it's the things that surround the shot that really make it work. The Atsumori shot initially is super intimate and perhaps the most intimate this show has been, which is really funny because this show is still very intimate overall. <laughs> and by so intimate, I really mean in the way that it punches in to the point to which it dominates the majority of the frame. Most of it is taken up by him to the point to which we can see the hair coming into his mouth 
and the water coming out of his nose. But if we look at some of the shots surrounding this, they feel extremely detached and distant as the we have these wide shots looking out at the water. The majority of it you could classify as empty space and by empty, I don't mean nothing in it and it's irrelevant, but more so it's space that isn't taken up by any subjects or human subjects. This director is basically able to dip between these varying shot distances and I think that says a lot about the fragile nature of life and political power which this show talks about and and is a massive topic in this show. It, we can go from of course being the most intimate and having it all, having this golden moment and then the next second you know it, it's completely gone and there's nothing there anymore. Uh, in an instant, everything can be crushed and everything can, you can take forever to grow. You can create something, but it can be crushed right there and then. They're able to disconnect and perhaps disengage from the situation so quickly and instantly. And that leaves quite a mark on the viewer, at least it did for me in the sense that it, it just feels that whole moment feels almost irrelevant now. And I don't mean that in a bad way, I mean it in a good way and how uh, that <laughs> that intimacy is just being relegated and it, it's, not, it's not ever to be seen again as we now just have this shot of, of his enemy just standing in the water and just, you know, looking at <laughs> water now as his face just sinks into the ocean. It's actually to definitely build on the concepts of this show really well being death and political power and it's nothing short of stunning. So just some quick takeaways from this episode. Uh, I don't want to take up too much more time because I've said a lot, but I'm just going to condense basically the very core aspects of Tax Cheater's style and just some things we can learn. The first thing is really that lighting is just such an important part of animation and what makes it so mesmerizing is the way that it's simply constructed or molded by the creatives working on said thing. It can be used to communicate the most happy of emotions or the deepest darkest of feelings and desires and Tax Cheater does exactly that and shows us the potential of lighting in animation and even natural lighting and how that can be used. This is also something I've made clear on the podcast previously, but the lens is also super important. You cannot forget the lens, particularly when looking at a filmmaker or creative like Takshita or Naoki Yamada. It's fundamentally kind of what they're alongside, of course, you could say lighting, I guess, because light affects the lens, but how the lens constructs the image, or at least that that's what the impression they try to create is so fundamental to their style. And it, it is it takes animation to a very different place. It, it's an art in itself to convey it, this very realistic means of shooting that often animation doesn't perhaps lean into as much. And it it, it honestly is stunning in, in a lot of cases. The amount of technical know-how and study I'm sure it took in order to really construct this really solid system for, for lighting one's episodes uh, I really can't conceive how much time that would have taken. And finally, composition. Takshid's compositions are so are oozing with meaning and ideas to be taken from them. Every shot helps us, and I'd just say all the mechanics in this episode, if you can quote that, it goes such a long way of explaining, or at least denoting what is going on when it comes to the Heiki and the Genji, the Heiki and society, and just the fall of the Heiki as a whole. Every shot can be broken down and analyzed. And it's, I think that's kind of what filmmaking is all about and animation, honestly. We can learn so much about storytelling and filmmaking from Takashita's camera work. And I definitely learned loads of lessons watching this episode. So that is a wrap for another Guess in the Mecca episode. I do hope you enjoyed this one. I, I really did enjoy this one. <laughs> I, I also did enjoy this episode myself, as you could probably tell. I, I love talking about this sort of stuff. Um, so thank you, of course, for your support, as always. 
Um, I hope you did enjoy or at least find interesting if you're watching on YouTube the um, some of the new ideas I've tried in this episode. I, I really tried to make things a bit more interesting and, and you know do some composition breakdown or whatever uh, and yeah I, I hope it worked. Tell me in the comments and tell me in the comments what do you feel about this episode? Heiki Monogatari episode 9. Did you like it? Did you not like it? Is it overrated? Uh, what, what do you think about it, um, tell me in the comments below. So uh, if you did enjoy this episode, as always, it would be very appreciated if you liked the video. Um, we don't have dislikes now, so <laughs> well, we do, but you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> subscribe to the channel. If you're on audio, if you could follow on whatever audio platform you're on. And of course, the all special podcast review if you can, that's a link in the description. If you could leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, that goes a really, really long way for the show. So um, thank you once again for listening and I will see you next week or whenever I get the next episode done <laughs> of Get in the Mag. The music in this production goes as follows. Synthwave by Alex, by Alex McCulloch. 